Genesis chapter 35. We'll be in on it. Peter Bottles with me, please turn there tonight. Genesis chapter 35. Does everyone have a handout? Everybody good? Everybody's got a handout tonight? You should have the one that says Return to Bethel, Genesis 35. Simeon and Levi went through and they slaughtered all the men of Shechem. Um, 
check this leads right to this point here. So Jacob is now terrified because he, that his sons, what his sons did. And now he's fearful that the people, the surrounding people in this area will now slaughter them, will come after them because of the actions in which uh, Jacob's sons did. So we come to this point here, we see that there was big promises that God made. We see little faith. You see the return to Bethel there, it says little faith, big God. So little faith is referring to Jacob here. Jacob's been promised all this by God. What do we know about God and promises? He keeps them. He keeps them. That's why we can trust the Bible is true. Because it's God's word. So God cannot lie. So therefore his word is his word. So his word is truth. His word is true. So as we, we study, it's why it's so important we study God's word. So we know his word because it is true. And what is said here is going to happen if it's not already happening. But we see here Jacob has little faith. And I think we can probably all put ourselves in, in Jacob's shoes because we've probably run across times in our own walk that we, we showed little faith. Amen? We probably can all testify to that. There was times in which we know we're serving a big God. We know we're serving a God that, that um, wants what's best for us. He, he, he leads us uh, and, and truly we're supposed to follow Him and His guidance. And, and there are times though that we, we have this little faith like Jacob had. So as we come here to verse th or chapter 35, I'm going to go ahead and read uh, chapter 35, and then we'll, we'll go into it here. So return to Bethel. He's in chapter 35, it says, God said to Jacob, get up, go to Bethel and settle there. Build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his family and to all that were with him, get rid of the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your clothes. We must get up and go to Bethel. I will build an altar there to God who answered me in my day of distress. He has been with me everywhere I've gone. And then they gave Jacob all their foreign gods and their earrings, and Jacob hid them under the oak near Shechem. <clears throat> when they were out, a terror from God came over the cities around them, and they did not pursue Jacob's sons. So Jacob and all who were with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. Jacob built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, El Bethel, because it was there that God had revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. Deborah, one who had nursed and raised Rebekah, died and was buried under the oak near south of Bethel. So Jacob named it Alon Bakuth. God appeared to Jacob again after he returned from Padanaram, and he blessed him. God said to him, Your name is Jacob, and you will no longer be named Jacob. But, the, but your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. God also said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply a nation. Indeed, an assembly of nations will come from you. And kings will descend from you. And I will give you the land that I gave, your, gave to Abraham and Isaac. And I will give the land to your future descendants. Then God withdrew from him the place where he had spoken to him. Jacob set up a marker at the place where he had spoken to him. A stone marker. He poured a drink offering on it and anointed it with oil. Jacob named the place where God had spoken with him Bethel. They set out from Bethel. When they were still some distance from Ephraim, that's uh, Bethlehem, the old name for Bethlehem, Ephraim, Rachel began to give birth, and her labor was hard, was difficult. During her difficult labor, the midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, you have another son. With her last breath, for she was dying, she named him ben but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Jacob set up a marker on her grave. It is the marker of Rachel's grave still today. Israel set out again and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. While Israel was living in that region, Reuben went in and slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah, and Israel heard about him. Jacob had 12 sons. Leah's sons were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Rachel's sons were Joseph and Benjamin. The sons of Rachel's slave Bilhah were Dan and Naphtali. The sons of Leah's slave Zilpah were Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Jacob who were born to him at Adonaram. Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mount at Mombre in Kirath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived 180 years. He took his last breath and died and was gathered to his people 
old and full of days. His sons Esau and Jacob buried him. So, we come here to chapter 35. We'll start there at the beginning of it. So, um, as we said before, we see here little faith from Jacob, but we've got a big God. We've got one that, that supplies and takes care of us, one that, that has given us all things. Most importantly, he's given us uh, salvation. As we look to uh, Jacob here, this is the Lord came to him before at Bethel, like I said. At that point, Abraham or, or Jacob believed. He believed at that point there. So God finds uh, Jacob here. He finds him in... Um, I, I, I'm try, I try to picture it a lot of times. I try to picture God's word as I'm... I, I want to visualize it sometimes. And, and he says to Jacob, he says, get up. I, I visualize Jacob moping and just kind of laying around. I don't know if any of y'all been depressed before and, and didn't feel like moving. So I, I look at Jacob and I see a, a, a man who's depressed, a man who's scared. A man that, doesn't, that really doesn't know what to do next. And God finds him here and he says to Jacob, he says, get up. So we find him open, we find him pouting, we, uh, we see a, a scared Jacob not trusting or believing God's promise to him to supply his need in this time of, of trouble, this time of turmoil. No, we know as we, we look back on, on, on Jacob's life, we know that, that it's kind of, it's been an up and, and down battle with him. He's, he's had a lot of, uh, of, uh, trials through this period, but he's always seen God take him up out of there. He's always seen God provide. He came to the area in which he, which he met his wives and put around him. He had nothing as he got there. His mom sent him there saying, just go up there a few days and find a wife who was there for over 20 years. While he was there, God had provided him wives. God had provided him, basically he's coming there with nothing, but he leaves with all kinds of, of livestock. He, he leaves rich. As we look through Jacob, though, he's not been a model follower. Even though God has revealed himself to Jacob, he promised deliverance to Jacob. He promised blessing to Jacob. He promised fertility to Jacob. We see all this happen. Jacob, who had nothing at first, God made him prosperous. If we, if we look here, we, we look through, the, God even wrestled with him. If you, if you look back a, a few chapters back, God got a hold of him and wrestled him and, and Jacob, got, Jacob wasn't going to let go of him because he, he wasn't going to let go until he got blessed by God. Yet we find Jacob here scared, hiding, and hoping not to get overtaken by the local peoples. He looks at, he's looking in fear of man and not faith in God. So he tells him, he says, get up. He says, go to Bethel. Go to Bethel. I wonder if that sparks something in his mind because if you think about it, this is... This is um, the point in which Jacob believed. And I believe if, if you're a Christian, you, you believe. I, I remember where I was at when I was saved. You, I, I remember when where the Lord uh, delivered me, where the Lord revealed himself to me, where I believed and, and trusted him at the first time. And, and it, it's a moment that I will not forget. So when he, he says to him to go to Bethel, I believe he's probably thinking, man, wow, I get to go back to the place in which I believed, the place in which I, I knew that God and, and knew God for who he was who he is. So it's been more than 25 years. I believe it's around 28. And I'm not exactly positive. It doesn't you just get my Bible has a couple different dates and they're kind of got question marks behind them. But it was at least more than 25 years since uh, Jacob was fearing for his life from his brother Esau and God spoke to Jacob in an awesome dream in Bethel. In that dream uh, Jacob saw a stairway from earth to heaven and he saw angels going up and down it. Uh, there, God promised Jacob the land. He promised him the land there. He promised him uh, offspring that was like the sand of the sea, that, that innumerable offspring. He promised him blessing on all people through him and his offspring. There would be blessings from, for, from him and also through his offspring. And he told Jacob, he said, I am with you. I will never leave you. And I will bring you back. I will bring you back to this land. And this opened Jacob's eyes, and he believed. And like I said earlier, God always keeps his promises. That's one thing you can always um, trust and always know, that God will keep his promises. But he tells him to get up. He tells him to go to Bethel. He tells him to build an altar. He gives him three commands here. God gives him three commands here. Get up, go to Bethel, build an altar. 
So the last time that Jacob was there, he made a, a pillow stone a marker of the event. So the, the stone in which he laid his head on that night was what he used to mark the event of his belief, of his conversion. He took that pillow stone, he anointed it with oil, but he says this time you're to go and you're to make an altar. You're to make an altar for worship. So Jacob prepares for worship. So when we, I think when we, we come to Father's house, we should be prepared to worship. So we come prepared. So what does he do to prepare here? What does he do to prepare here? So as Jacob looks at his family, so he knows he's going back to the place in which he first believed. He knows he's going to the, uh, he knows he's going to build an altar. He knows there's going to be worship here. So he goes and he looks at his family, and his family is not really in the, the best spiritual shape. Jacob's not done, done the best job in the world leading his family because he goes and the first thing he says to his, his wives, the first thing he says to his family, he says, put away your foreign gods, little G. Put away your foreign gods, little G. They had picked up gods. We know that, that Rachel had taken gods from these little ornamental gods, I guess, from, his, uh, from her father's house, Laban, and was hiding them, was hid them underneath her when Laban came. That's one of the things he came looking for when he when he approached uh, Jacob when he was leaving with his wives and family. They had picked up these idols and, and probably as they have gone along the way, they probably picked up a few things along the way as well. Because we know they were, they were moving through lands that, that were not believers. They were uh, followers of, of foreign gods. But he tells them to put away these foreign gods. Jacob commands his family then to, to purify yourselves. Purify yourselves. Change your clothes. So this serves to portray both cleansing from defilement by idolatry and the consecration of the heart to the Lord. This is preparation. This is call to worship. Prepare for worship here. And he tells them we must go to Bethel. This is the place where Jacob first believed. It's a great reminder of him of who gave him all things and who controls all things. And who God is. Here he tells his family that at Bethel I will build an altar, and there to God who has anointed me in my day of distress, he told them. So he anointed him in his day of distress at that point there. He's going to do the same here. And he's been with me everywhere I've gone. Jacob understands. Jacob gets it. He knows that, that everything he has is because of the Lord. He's, he's blessed him in everything he's done. He's been with him everywhere. He's provided protection for him. The only explanation he has for not being killed by his brother is God. If you remember in that portion there when, when his brother came and his brother, he was fearing for his life and his brother gave him mercy. His, his brother gave him forgiveness. He saw a picture of God's forgiveness there. He said to his brother, he said, I've seen God's face. Like I've seen just how God works through your forgiveness. Because God forgives. The response. The response of family, Jacob, and God. We're going to see the, the response of all of these here. So the family had been given commands. The family was given commands to turn over their gods, little g, to turn over their gods, little g, and their earrings. And they did so. They, they turned them all over. They, they, they gave them to the patriarch. They gave him to Jacob. They gave him to uh, later on, or he's told him before, he's telling him again, he reiterates with him, with, with Jacob that his name is Israel. So he gave them, they gave them to him. And Jacob, his response to this, he took the gods and the earrings and says, and hid it under the oak tree in Shechem. And from my studies, this, this, they think this may be the same oak tree that Abraham uh, spoke of earlier in Genesis. And they prepared themselves for that, that they leave for Bethel. They're preparing themselves for that. God protected Israel by setting terror over the city so they would not follow after them. So uh, the thing in which uh, Jacob worried about was the locals seeing this. The locals uh, maybe out of fear of what they may, that may, might deceive them and try to do the same thing to them or uh, just retaliation as to what... Uh, Jacob's family did to Shechem. But God made sure there was terror over them. They're afraid to act upon this. 
So they, did, they left him alone and let him try. So now we're going to look at obedient worship. Obedient worship. So they arrive in Bethel. So as they arrive in Bethel, Jacob builds an altar there to God. And he calls it the God of Bethel. El Bethel. He calls the place El Bethel because it was the place God revealed himself to Jacob when he was fleeing Esau. Jacob here is reconfirming his allegiance to God. It tells us during this time that, that Deborah... This is Jacob's mother's nurse and nanny here. She, she dies here and is buried under the oak tree south of Bethel. And Jacob named the place Alon Bakuth, which means the oak of weeping is what, what that means, the oak of weeping. And then God appears to Jacob again. So God appears to Jacob here and uh, God here as he um, appears to Jacob, he, he reiterates. So God reiterates his promises to Jacob. You may wonder, how many times does God have to do this? How many times does God have to tell him that these are my promises? This is what I was, I'm going to do, Jacob. This is not something you have to worry about anymore. Trust me. So God's told him, he said, God blessed Jacob. God told him that you're no longer Jacob, but Israel. Remember when he, when he, when he wrestled with God, that's what he was told. His name was Israel. Israel, no longer Jacob. He told him, I am the God, I am God Almighty. He told him to be fruitful and multiply. We, we see that. We saw that, that God just blessed him in this regard. He says, you'll be an assembly of nations will come from you. Kings will descend from you. I will give you the land promised to Abraham and Isaac. I will give you the land of your future descendants. And it says, God withdrew himself from him. So Jacob response to this. So how does Jacob respond to this? So he had already made an altar to God. Well, uh, to mark the occasion, he set up a pillar or a marker to mark where God had spoken to him, a stone marker, just a, a place to, to, so he, he could look at and see this is where God spoke to him. And this is like, remember just what God said to me at this spot. And it said that he poured up a drink offering on it. And when I, I looked up drink offering, it said that uh, it was about a third gallon of wine that would be taken and it, it would pour on this. And this was to, to conse consecrate it for the worship of God. It says they then anointed it with oil just as he did before. And again, he reiterated the name of the place is Bethel. The name of the place is Bethel. So then we find out that he lives happily ever, happily ever after, Right? And never had issues again, right? Have you ever heard someone say that being a Christian is easy? I've, I've heard people say it. I've heard people say it. I'm thinking, that there's no way. Being a Christian is not easy. It's not easy uh, being a Christian. There's going to be sorrows just like everyone else has. Just because we're believers does not mean we don't go through sorrows. But it does mean one thing. We understand one thing about true faith. True faith always perseveres. True faith always perseveres. Now, Jesus told us, if we turn to Matthew chapter 7, this is what happens with true faith. So, one thing I, 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 can, I can probably promise you, you're going to go through issues. You're going to have troubles. You're going to have trials. You're going to have sorrows, just like Jacob's going through here. So, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. This is that, that true faith that perseveres I'm talking about. So it's therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. The reason true faith does persevere, the reason true faith doesn't collapse is because it's not built upon uh, a situation, not built upon a circumstance, not built on, on a feeling. But yet it's built on a rock. Our faith is, is built on God. It's built on Jesus Christ. And storms are a part of life. Sorrows are a part of life. I can testify that, that through these storms and through these sorrows and through these trials, growth happens. Growth happens. We see that, that through this, uh, Jacob was scared 
And we've seen several times before that Jacob went through different things and God brought him through. And we see growth each time. And the same thing will happen with us. But he'd gone through troubles. God had went and spoke to him and, and brought him through that. And then we see again that there's sorrows to come. First, he, 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 first love lost is the first one. First love lost. Rachel was his first love. Rachel was the one he wanted to marry. Rachel wasn't looking to marry Leah. He was deceived into marrying her. But he loved Rachel. If he could pick a wife to lose, it wouldn't be Rachel. He loved her. He, this is the one he, he, he just adored her. We see that it looked like a time to rejoice because Rachel was ready to, to deliver her second child. Rachel had trouble with childbirth. He, she had struggled and, and thought that she couldn't have children. She, she finally had Joseph. She becomes pregnant again. And, and certainly they were they were. Sure, joyful, awaiting, joyfully awaiting this child. She has a boy, a man child. She had struggled during her labor. She dies while delivering her son, Benjamin. She dies shortly after delivering Benjamin. She, as he, she finds out that as a, a boy, she names him Benoni, which means son of my sorrow. Ben and I, son of my sorrow, but uh, Jacob, when he sees him, he doesn't name him son of my sorrow. He names him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. He gets, he elevates him. He gives him a, a better name, son of my right hand. The Bible tells us that Rachel is uh, buried on the way to Bethlehem. So we see that, that he lost his first love. The Bible then tells us that his, his first son, Reuben, uh, defiles his wife. <clears throat> Reuben slept with, with Jacob's concubine, Bilhah. He goes and, and, and defiles the, the marriage bed of Jacob. And then he kind of got like, runs into like a, three things right in a row happens to him. And then he finds out that his father here, who's 180 years old, his father, Isaac, dies. He dies in Hebron at the age of 180. The Bible tells us there at the end that, that Jacob and his brother, and, and whether you, I wonder if you see this or not, but God promised him that he would bring him back to his homeland there, and, and, and he does. He does. He brings Jacob back and his brother Esau, and they both come back together and bury their dad, Isaac. So some takeaways. We want to look at this. What can we apply? How can we apply this as we look at these scriptures tonight? So, what reasons do we have not to trust God's promises? We kind of talked about that a little bit. Is there any reason we can have to not promise God or not to, to trust God's promises? We don't have one, do we? Why do we try to handle life's trials on our own? Why is it when we, we come across struggles just like Jacob did? Jacob was kind of going to hide out because he didn't trust God. And, and, and are there times in our life in which we do the same? Are there times in which we try to cover things up or we try to fix it on our own? We get into trouble and we try to go and, and fix this on our own. We, we try to take care, take care of it ourselves. If we turn to Proverbs 3, 5 through 7, I'll, I'll just go ahead and read it. You don't have to turn that. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. You get a chance tonight to turn that and read it tonight. But trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, know Him. And he will make your path straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So we've got to trust the Lord. We've got to believe in him and know that, that he is in control. Even at the times in which we feel like our life isn't. One thing we need, we need to understand that, that there's not one thing we go through in life that God does not allow us to go through. Never. There's, there's not, you can't blame it on the devil because the Lord's allowing you to go through this trial. Allowing you to go through the sorrow. And he's, he's there for us. So we saw that, that, that Jacob's family had idol issues. So they had things that got between them and God. They had, they had actual visible idols. So we, we look today and you may look at what you, how your life is or, or what you have in your life. You may not necessarily have a small 
uh, golden calf. And I want you to look at this and try to look in your eyes. So what idols in our lives that we need to be put away so we can freely serve and worship? I think today it can, it can be anything from our jobs. It can be um, our hobbies. There's a lot of things we could put between us and God. There, there, there's a lot of things today. We could, we could just take the term busyness. And, and a lot of us use that excuse. We're too busy to, to serve God. Too busy to study His Word. Too busy. We're too, we use a lot of things. And a lot of times it has to revolve around money. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. The Bible says, Jesus here says, No one can serve two masters since either he will hate one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and money. He's given us a, a good example. This is probably one of the, the big things that, that we can pro we probably have in our lives that, that cause us to, to uh, pull away from our true worship of God. These, these idols get in our way. So how often do we go to Bethel? Do we constantly desire communion with the Lord? How often do we go to Bethel? So we said Bethel was the place where uh, Jacob first met the Lord. So you can look at that river. I think we can probably just think back and uh, remember the place, or maybe we're at, you're at the place where the Lord opened your eyes and you, you believed for the first time. But I think we also got to look at Bethel as the place that we, we go to because Jacob knew when he got there, he was going to get to, to speak to God. He was going to uh, commune with God. He was going to worship with God. So Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. I, I added 7. So we're going to do Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. It says, don't worry about anything. But everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus. So we don't go around worrying about things. We, we, we bring it to the Lord. We bring our petitions, our supplications. We bring, bring it all to Him. He wants us to. He wants us to bring all things to Him. He doesn't want us to sit back and worry about stuff. He doesn't want us to, to, to take it and, and bury it and think, well, this is just my problem, God. I'll take care of this myself. And we do that sometimes. Sometimes we try to, to take this ourselves. He doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to turn it all over to Him. Share all things with Him. We need to remember how God delivered us from death into life through the sacrifice of His only Son, Jesus Christ. We need to remember that. We need to remember where God took us from, where He brought us from. Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. It says, unto you were dead in your trespasses and sin. So before we were saved, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the rulers of the power of the air. And the Spirit now works in the, working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, just like the world. We lived just like the world, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and were by nature children under wrath as others were also. It says, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he loved us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. He also raised us up, up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness unto us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and it is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not from works, so that one can boast. So that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So we need to remember that. We need to remember uh, the desperate situation we are in. And, and, and in doing so, I think we'll have greater appreciation to him. I think, I think, I think in our worship, we'll be a little more broken as we look uh, of where he brought us from. And I think also in our, our witness will be a little more humble and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, not look at others around us as less than us. We'll, we'll want to share the gospel with more people because we'll know that where God brought us from. And if God can bring me from here, he can bring you from there as well. I'm not referring to you in general. I'm talking about the, the world in which we share the gospel. 
those that we pray for, the lost that are out there. Just remember how God brought us from death unto life. And He can do the same for them. And the final question here says, um, so as long as we live here on earth, there are going to be times of loss. There are going to be times of trials. Man is going to disappoint us. So um, I know we, we, we've got a lot of trust, people we trust here, but man will let us down. If we put our trust in, in a person, that person will let us down, will hurt us. And things won't go how we want them to. to. It's, we, a lot of times we, we make a, a plan. And those of us that, that are planning to retire, we, we put money aside to plan. we got this big, long plan, and I plan to retire on, um, on the, third, the third week of June in 2026, wherever it may be. We make these big plans that, that sometimes won't happen that way. So as we, we look at this and we have these trials, we have these troubles, we have these uh, tribulations, we have these illnesses, we have these things that come upon us. So uh, these are the times to trust in the Lord and His provision. So flip over to Romans, we're going to close with this last verse here. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 5. It says, Therefore, since we have, we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through Him by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our afflictions. Because we know that affliction produces endurance. And endurance improved, it produces proven character. And proven character produces hope. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. I like that because it tells us that this affliction we go through, this trouble we go through, this trial we go through produces endurance. Produces, you, you, you grow through these. And we grow close to the Lord. And our hope no longer is not hope upon the, cir the circumstance. Our hope is no longer on um, retirement. Our hope is no longer on a relationship. Our hope is no longer on uh, a retirement destination maybe. But our hope is in Christ Jesus. Our hope is in Christ Jesus. And He tells us this and shows us this love through the Holy Spirit which He gave us. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for this day. We thank You, Father, for Your Word. We pray that You, you, you help us, Lord, in times in which we uh, have little faith. We pray You just help us, Lord, to have the, the faith we need just to trust You, Lord, in the difficult times, Lord. Help us, Lord, to always just turn it over to you. To put it in your hands, Lord, if we know that uh, you're always in control. Help us, Lord, to, to see the, the big picture at times. Help us, Lord, to understand that this world is not our home. We're, we're just uh, pilgrims here for a short period of time. That, that life is just but a vapor here for a little while. And get out of the way. We pray that you help us to keep things in perspective, Lord, to love you cherish you, to share you, Lord, with a loss of dying world, Father, that's not getting any better. We just pray now as we leave this place, Father, you just uh, give us the, the desires of your heart and to live for you. Father, if we love you, we praise you, we thank you in Jesus' name.